I know that there wasn't necessarily a ton of um, experience from the food supply chain side, but maybe if you guys can speak to kind of the culture within procurement departments and how you try and get traction with the people who are willing to be innovative. So how to sell the procurement? <laughs> <laughs> Just solve it. I yeah, would hate to sell the procurement. <laughs> first. Want me to take this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, Jan, you want to, or? Well, you have experience in the food business. Why don't you start? Yeah, yes. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, if you're, from an, if you're looking at low margin businesses, um, where what we found with at least Scout, there's what we've, uh, it, in the Valley, there's, um, savings is like almost a dirty word in San Francisco. It's just like spend, spend, spend. Uh, efficiency, velocity, that's the most important thing. But like when you go to like East Coast, Midwest, it's like savings is something people really care about and they do that. So for us and what we've been trying to do a lot of it is uh, straight up ROIs. Uh, it's really jumping in and actually, and we're starting to do a lot more of that. It's like getting into the nitty gritties and, and that requires asking some really uncomfortable questions, uh, which some people are open to sharing and some maybe struggle, but it's like asking the questions like, okay, so what are, what are your goals today? Like, what are you doing today? What are your goals in 12 months from now? Let's talk through what, with basically your team, what you can accomplish. What if we go these four scenarios? What's the likelihood that these scenarios will happen? Uh, and you're actually building a full ROI business case. So when they go and ask for dollars, um, there's actually a justifiable reason versus asking, uh, hey, can, can we potentially get something? Like you have to have data, you have to have that information, especially for low margin businesses. Um, because in restaurants, yeah, I mean, it's a few percent uh, and you, you, you have to justify what those few percent should be spent on yours to drive more. Stan, yeah, I, I do yeah. want to add to that. You know, the problem, right? And those people who do RFPs will kind of, I think, um, see this as true. You, are, you have these decisions, and this is the procurement person, right? They have to sort through these different options, and they have to come back with a recommendation, and they may feel ill-equipped to do that and don't want to say it. Every profession has people who are really phenomenal, and every profession has people who are somewhat Neanderthalish and stuck in their ways, and, and, and that's a reality. What I have seen is this, right? When, when you talk to people at companies, um, suppliers, potential suppliers, um, you don't get a clear point of difference. Someone will come in, and the first one will come in, and they'll say, well, you know, the people sitting in this room, we have a combined 120 years of experience. And the next one will come in and say it's 90 years. And, and, and you get that as a rationale. To the extent that you can differentiate yourself, and you can give something that sets you apart. You know who your competition is. If you can set yourself apart uh, from your competition in some way, I think that really goes a long way to you know, getting you ahead because you give that procurement person something unique that they can articulate back to their management. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, question for Scott. Um, way back in your slides, you mentioned in the 2018 plus section, I noticed part of your plan was uh, third party innovators and subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what you had in mind when you wrote that. Who so, are, yeah. Fair, fair question. So uh, a few things, and, and one of the things that I talked about is, um, you know, when we staffed, um, we looked very, very hard at the categories that we wanted to cover. You know, so we have we we broke up our spend into six key buckets. You know, between stores, you know, all the things we buy for stores. You know, millwork, flooring, carpeting, fixtures, and then we have IT, we have marketing. So you know, we have all of our major categories covered. But one of the things I mentioned, too, is that, um, you know, there's some areas we don't want to staff for, you know. Um, it's, uh, we, you know, as, as Nick could attest to, we have a very lean and mean department. Um, and frankly, you know, for the, for the environment, that's a good place to be. Uh, you know, there are categories that only come up every couple of years, and, you know, you only need that expertise in a period of time. So we don't, you know, we would rather buy the buy. So we'll, we'll bring in the experts for those categories when the time is right. 
and we have a list of categories that we have identified for that. So category expertise is one. Tools are another. So we're constantly looking at, um, you know, whether it's uh, AI or even, even just e-sourcing. You know, we're looking at our toolbox and how we can continually refresh that. Um, we're not going to try to develop those ourselves. There's some great products out in the marketplace, so we'll leverage the external marketplace for that. Um, and then the last one, really, you know, uh, when we looked at those, you know, major categories of spend and, uh, you know, what our long-term goals were, um, when I joined two and a half years ago, we were probably uh, engaged in 40% of our spend in, on, the indirect, on the indirect side. Today, it's probably 70 to 75. We don't ever want to get to 100, right? I mean, that tail is very long. So um, one of the other things that we are assessing as far as third-party opportunities is what are we going to do with that tail of spend because, um, you know, it's the 80-20 rule. You know, that tail is very long and it's not going to make sense to staff up to try to manage that. You know, the ROI isn't there, so how do we, how do we tackle it? So we're looking at some options there as well. So I'd say those three areas are the big areas that we're looking at for third-party support. Scott, on the same slide earlier on in the phase, um, where you're kind of basically setting up the the department and kind of getting into more areas of spend. Uh, it's been interesting. Interesting. I was working with a client about a year and a year and a half ago, um, and they had basically just taken all of the different business arms of, of their entire conglomerate and basically said, okay, now we have a procurement department. And so everybody has to go through procurement. And she was talking about the trials and tribulations of that and how, you know, her, her thought process on it was that, you know, basically the way that they were going to be able to um, get uh, stakeholders uh, to trust them was to basically prove it that you mm -hmm. know they had expertise in the area they were going to be able to negotiate and you know source on their behalf and come out with a great um, uh, result and then um, for a, a much uh, and then for a, a company that had been around for much longer it was interesting because we actually worked with them on a video campaign internally so that they could then share that with all the internal stakeholders to say this is how you work with procurement this is how we work um, and so I was interested to know as you were kind of scaling up the procurement um, you know department and kind of getting into more areas of spend what tactics and strategies did you use internally to adopt procurement inside of coach yeah no it's a great question because mandates don't work right I mean you you can uh, and I'll be perfectly honest, that's kind of how we started. You know, um, I, I came in, we were, we were forming a centralized group, and it was going to be, hey, we're publishing these policies, uh, and anything over $50,000 has to go through this group, and that's how it is. It doesn't work. Um, it, it, uh, so we, we revised some things, we revised some of our policies, we revised, revised our thresholds, but more importantly, we, we staffed those category lead roles that really had to go out and prove it. Um, you know, again, our, our stores area, our packaging area, uh, IT, uh, advertising and marketing, um, transportation. We already had a transportation group, but they were integrated as part of the centralization. Um, we needed to prove it. <coughs> and, um, you know, uh, once we started to generate results and those key leaders that we were connected with uh, I mean, that was a big part of my job, is just to make sure that we were making connections, um, getting alignment on these categories that we were going to go after, and actually just start delivering. I mean, it was blocking and tackling, quite honestly, early on, and just being able to deliver some results. I'm like, oh, you know. I, you know, and I had the standard, you know, I don't want to call it a speech, but, a, you know, just a mantra that we dealt with with the stakeholders that, look, you're going to make the decision on who, you know, I remember having this discussion with our CMO. I'm not going to tell you what media agency you're going to buy from. You're going to determine that. We're going to run the process and we're going to lay out the facts for you. And I realize that's very standard blocking and tackling, but when you think about an organization where we had never done that, that was huge. So it took a lot of time. And it took a lot of time, as I mentioned before, to um, get over the, you know, bad feelings that were there from just the very short-sighted, hey, you know, we got to go out and grab a bunch of cash, had a third party come in and try. It wasn't as much, it was, it was probably equally the third party's fault as it was the company's fault for not, you know, having the right kind of top-down support on the whole thing. So um, long answer to a short question, but it really was about fundamentally we had to prove it 
category by category. And once we did, and then we started getting deeper into the uh, into the categories. Um, you know, it, it's that was how we built it. Uh, the, the fact is procurement is almost always on an island, right? It's just the nature of the beast. And so you're, what you're talking about, I mean, results are going to drive everything, right? But I used to work at Unilever across the river in Jersey, and you know, there was a best-in-class company, amazing. And their procurement organization said, you know what? We're done with our own goals. We're not going to have our own goals. So what they did is kind of in your kind of spirit what you're saying, they went out to the businesses and they said basically, let's create shared goals. So Unilever implemented globally a shared short scorecard, bottom line. If you were a buyer and you were buying corrugate, you had to demonstrate cost, cash, and uh, revenue, basically. You had to basically, all your metrics were driven to the same business metrics. If you were in brand management and you were running Lipton brand, you were buying cartons for Lipton, if you were running the factory, and, we'll, and it's important because what I have found in my experience across the supply chain is that one part of the company is saving a lot of money and getting all the pats on the back, but they're undermining the rest of the company somehow. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, classic is manufacturing. Factories save money all the time, but they decrease speed to market. That doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help consumers. So that, that's an example that every business I've seen lives in. That's like the island of like performance, I call it, right? So get away with that. Go to your business people. Establish shared goals. Get your leadership to, to and let's be honest, shared goals is simple. It's cost and cash. So that's it. Manage those share. Figure out, my team at Unilever had to figure out how does that impact cash? How does that impact cost? If you can't explain it, you're not, you're not worth it. You've got to be able to do those basics. At business school, we all know how this works. And then you basically triangulate the conversation back to the business. Our results are that simple because everybody talks the language of those things in a public traded company. And so I think getting that alignment fast is critical and then driving your procurement work to those metrics. And don't get fuzzy and complicated. You can go on and find 50 different procurement metrics that make sense and matter. They're all great. I've chased them all. Save, you know, impact cost, impact cash, understand the trade-offs because I've been in businesses where I've, ex I've gone to clients. We're going to spend a lot more money here, CFO. Well, you're supposed to save me money. No, but I'm going to reduce the cost of goods in a different way, or I'm going to drive it into cash improvements. And those people are smart to get that. Well, one thing I'll add to that, and it's a, it's a very good point, and it's also understanding the metrics. So marketing is a great example. Working uh, with the marketing group on media, um, one of the first questions I asked our CMO, do you buy to budget or do you buy to reach? Well, they buy to budget. Okay, well, one of the first things we needed to do was establish the baseline. Like, what is a GRP costing you? before we did the pitch, you know, because the intention was we're going to make sure that we can deliver you the same reach for less money. And then you can very clearly identify what it costs, and then, and then you can identify the value. Okay, well, what if I actually spent the same? Now I've got more reach, which more reach should generate into more impressions. More impressions should drive revenue. Uh, it's a lot more of a tangible discussion than it was otherwise. So, um, you know, getting that baseline right up front was, was a key thing, too. Hi, uh, thank you for your answers. Actually, it touched upon the answers to the question that I'm going to ask right now, but I'm very curious. We touched upon value. Uh, Scott actually is the person that I'd like to ask this question to because you mentioned in one of your slides that uh, when you came to coach, uh, it was a very cost savings oriented, uh, not procurement organization, but overall cost savings oriented uh, firm. And you said that over the years into tapestry, you helped uh, transition it into a value, more value-oriented, uh, more West Coast acceptable <laughs> um, uh, firm. Uh, so we talked about metrics, but I'm just wondering in through this formation, and you touched upon like touching the categories, you know, like the trying to get to the long tail and like the indirect categories that you know were not really addressed before, but if you were to choose one primary example of how you convinced stakeholders, businesses, or let's say executive management that procurement reports to, let's say, uh, what would be the one primary thing that you were able to convince them by? Like, it's, it's th that migration from cost savings to value generation. Mm -hmm. um, is it like, you know, you may have followed different uh, tactics along the way. Uh, in addition to what you 
promise, let's say, to executive management, but what did you put on the table and said, you know, we're going to leave aside, or maybe just like we're not going to focus so much on cost savings, but through these metrics, tools, and whatever, you know, like, you know, through spend focus, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to focus on these. And, uh, you know, if you have one example to share with us, I'd really yep. appreciate it. Because yeah, it's, it's be usually that. not seen as like, you know, East Coast, West Coast, I don't know, but like, it's not usually seen as um, a tangible output. Uh, maybe ROI is more like a you know well-known uh, tool of of understanding that value, but it's still another way of cost saving, so to speak. Yeah. So I'd like to you know get your opinion on that. Sure. Uh, so one clarification, you know, when I did come in, and, and you're right, it was on the heels of a of a cost savings initiative, but it was not a cost savings culture at all. You know, fashion retail, very high margin, they like to spend. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. I mean, look at this building, you know. It's, it's, um, yeah, I'm really enjoying the sunset. I know. It's, it's lovely. Look at that. You know, that's a million dollar view. <laughs> um, but, but the, uh, you know, so it, and that was kind of part of the challenge is that um, there were a few key people that were looking at the bottom line and really determining, hey, we, we have an imperative, we need to save some money, and that was kind of what drove that kind of short-term exercise that we'd been mopping up after for the last couple of years. So it wasn't really a cost savings culture. Um, and it's, it, and then, uh, you know, so there are a couple of things that happened. Obviously with our acquisition of Kate Spade, that was about integration, so there was a real need to drive a lot of synergy. Um, and that was a great accelerator, frankly, for our group. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're able to do what works the best, which is aggregate volume, uh, build scale, and that's been extremely helpful. But, you know, to your question, so one example I can, I can think clearly about, it, and it was in Asia. You know, we have an awful lot of, you, you think about the goods and services that we move across the world, freight forwarders, uh, brokers, um, air freight, uh, you name it. And, you know, we've got this you know, network all throughout Asia because we have big business there. We also have a lot of manufacturing there. And, um, you know, so we um, got involved with the various logistics groups out there who had never aggregated all their volume across all of the areas, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, Shanghai, Tokyo. So we took this holistic look across all of it, um, across air freight, across freight forwarders. And, you know, it took a tremendous amount of time just to aggregate all the data. But the bottom line was, you know, what did the business owner really want to accomplish? Well, they needed something more efficient because it was very fragmented. Um, they needed consolidation because it was because it was handled by all these different groups and it had never been aggregated. You had uh, much too deep of a supply base. So, frankly, all the goals that they wanted to accomplish had nothing to do with savings. It was all about efficiency. It was about consolidation. How do we deal with fewer touch points? How do we just get to a model where it's just easier to manage day to day? All of that meant scale which meant aggregation, which meant savings. So we took a very mature category that had just frankly never been aggregated. We ended up on the other side with a, with a much more efficient model that just naturally drove savings because it was more efficient. I mean, that was like the purest example of, you know, multi-brand pulling together a lot of volume. And, um, you know, the business owner couldn't have been more pleased because it was exactly what they wanted. And the savings just naturally came because of that. I wish they were all that easy. <laughs> you know, Sandra, I'd like to add something to that. Companies care about selling more. So to the extent that you can use your knowledge of the supplier network or your willingness to do some searching to find the suppliers who will help your company sell more, and then make that connection and step out of the way, it's golden in terms of, of setting up the procurement department for you know, wonderful interactions and partnerships going forward. So a lot of that has to do with understanding where your marketing group is headed, right? Or would like to be headed. You know, in my case, uh, the, if you've ever been to the liquor store and seen the twisted bottle for Smirnoff products, 
right? There's a, a product called Citrus Twist, and someone in the procurement department heard a marketing person say, you know, we did this ad for um, uh, showing hands twisting a bottle and lemons and limes popping out. We keep getting calls for a twisted bottle and we don't have one. And we know we can't make one because we know a twisted bottle would be too expensive. Right? And a procurement person made that connection and convinced the marketing folks that they could find a twisted bottle. Um, and it was a whopping success. They did find one, went to, I don't know, 30 glass companies. They, I think they went to every glass company in the world, found one out of France who figured out how to do a twisted bottle. Um, and uh, at a price point and a um, um, yeah, and one that could run in a high speed filling line, and um, it became golden for that supplier. It was a wonderful situation for the company because the brand grew and grew and grew from citrus to all kinds of flavors, and it was wonderful for that procurement organization because because it cemented them as people who didn't just go after savings, but understood that the holy grail, if you will, was um, make, helping the business sell what it wanted to sell. 